Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I'm there going. And, it, and had, hadn't that happened before? Yeah. Hadn't you showed up at a conference and the guy ahead of you? Preach your message. I don't mean you preach your text. <laughs> I mean preach your message. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it happens. It's not an uncommon thing to happen. And so the guy following up, uh, then he's got to figure out which way is he going to go now. And uh, But of course, if, if you spend enough time in there, uh, you're going to be able to figure it out. Huh? We never get done. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you never get done. That's right. You go back and preach the same, same thing and just put your... Put your twist on it. Put Amen. your flavor on it. Amen. All right. I'm not going to do the same thing Brother Jack did, but that's going to be my start place. Us cowboy preachers, we say, well, I'm going to tie my horse up at this hitching post, and then I'm going to wander around a bit. <laughs> and so that's what we're going to do. All right? All right. So we're in Philippians chapter 3. We will begin at verse 1. We're going to read down through verse 9. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. Uh, to the to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous for you to say. Now let me say something. How many of you got Bibles that look like this? <laughs> and, and when you're a preacher and you're reading that, your notes get over the verses and you stumble sometimes. And so if, uh, if I stumble up on the verses because I'm trying to read around my notes and actually get the text, you know, I had a preacher say one time, we don't live by the notes we make in our Bible, much less by our Bibles, you know. And there's some truth about that too, I guess. All right. And so again, verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And uh, I'd say that's one that we ought to pay attention to quite frequently. Have no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4 Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that uh, he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness of which is of the law, blameless. Now, I can almost see Paul writing this or preaching this. And, uh, you know, Paul, when he came to those times where he did this kind of boasting and he talked about this boasting, uh, he said, I speak as a fool. And I can almost see him as he's pinning these words or thinking these thoughts or maybe preaching this message. Uh, you can almost see him bowing his head. I hate to be <clears throat> spitting all this stuff out but it's just needful for me to do that for right. this message but uh because he goes on and tells us what he thinks about all that but it was necessary for him to lay all that out and so again now uh, uh we read down through verse six uh i think did we read verse six mm -hmm. okay good all right verse seven but what things were gained to me those i counted lost for christ yea doubtless and i count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Y'all do know what dung is? I mean, that's again a powerful statement. Count them but dung. If you spend any time around horses or cattle, you, you learn what dung is. Uh, who was it that talked about falling off the roof? <laughs> yeah. Falling off the roof into a big bunch of dung. <laughs> not, yeah, pretty. not pretty. We had a young lady in our church, and uh, she used to do a youth rodeo. And the boys told her, this is just a free story. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't have a thing to do with the message. It does have to do with dung. Uh, again, I'm talking about things my wife would rather I not talk about. It. <laughs> and believe me, I'm, I'm bridling myself. So. But uh, this young lady, she was about, she's 15 now. She was about 11 years old. And uh, she was doing these youth rodeos. Of course, she was doing the stuff girls do. She was doing the pole bending, the barrel racing, you know, stuff that the girls do. And uh, uh, the rodeo didn't have any rules about the girls doing other stuff. Uh, but uh, uh, there was one particular boy that kept goading her about bull riding. And uh, like, she couldn't do it. Well, she's one of them kind of girls. You know, you tell her she can't, 
And then Lurdy, she's going to show you I sure can. And so we were, we happened to be there at that particular youth rodeo, and she got up on that bull, and that bull came out of that chute, and it came to bucking and carried on doing what bulls do, you know, and that kind of thing. And, and off she came. Now, this is a real pretty little blonde-headed girl. <laughs> Guess where she landed? <laughs> In a pile of dung. And she wasn't bothered about it. She didn't make her eight seconds ride, and she didn't do that. She wasn't bothered about all that. She was. She rode the bull. She proved to that boy, yeah, girls can ride bulls. But, uh, buddy, she's still a girl. She come out of there, and that hair, that long blonde hair was covered in that stuff, and it was all down her back and down in her britches and everywhere else. And, and she was sure thankful her mom and daddy had that living course horse trailer there. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, Ella knows what dung is. Uh, at any rate, uh, so I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'll take some oh, that's and, free, right? Yeah, that was free. That was free. Yeah. Verse 9, finally, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that, that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. What I want to zero in on is this place here in verse 5, where Paul says, circumcise the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. I want to spend a few minutes this morning talking about Saul of Tarsus, the Pharisee. Because it's when you go back and read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read those uh, encounters uh, between John the Baptist and the Pharisees, or Jesus and the Pharisees, you learn a whole lot about who Saul of Tarsus was. And so go with me if you will. Well, no, before we do that, let me give some more information. I'm getting ahead of myself. So Paul calls himself a Pharisee here and, and gives that testimony in uh, Philippians 3, verse 5. Uh, after his arrest in Acts 21, as he's defending himself before the different courts, so to speak, uh, before the multitude in Acts 22, 3, uh, he talks about being raised at the feet of Gamaliel. And then you can go over there to Acts chapter 5 and you find out that Gamaliel was a Pharisee. So Paul was, Saul was brought up under Gamaliel and that's where he learned how to be or what it meant to be a Pharisee. And then in, uh, so that was before the multitude in Acts 22, before the council in Acts 23, he referred to himself as a Pharisee. And then uh, before Agrippa in Acts 26, he referred to himself as a Pharisee. So Paul called, he played that card when it was necessary, so to speak. And uh, it wasn't something he was necessarily proud of, but it was, it was a tool that helped him reach the audience he was preaching to. Amen. And that's what we do. We use the tools we have available to us to reach the audience we're, to whom we're preaching. And then... Uh, so we're kind of putting this in the context now of the earthly ministry of Christ and who Saul might have been and about his age maybe during that period of time. And if the people who are supposed to know actually know, then it's my understanding that Saul of Tarsus was born about six to ten years after Jesus was. And so when Jesus began his early ministry at 30, then Saul of Tarsus would have been in his uh, early to mid-twenties, depending on if it was six to ten years, you know, that time frame. So when Jesus begins at, at 30, Saul is, you know, 22, 23, 24, 25 years old, somewhere in that, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, do you remember, fellas, do you remember who you were when you were in your early mid-twenties? Do you remember who you were? <laughs> Man, you were full of everything, wasn't you? Yeah. Huh? Most of them. So, the expression I would use out of the pulpit is, you were full of piss and vinegar. <laughs> right? Right. I mean, buddy, yeah, I remember being 22, 23, 24 years old. Now here's Saul of Tarsus, and he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, and he'd been raised up, and he's 22, 23, 24 years old. He's full of himself. 
Uh, he, he probably got some pride going on in there. That's <laughs> who I am. I mean, Saul of Tarsus walked in the room. He looked around to see who saw him walk in. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's Saul of Tarsus. I mean, he, he, had, he was getting the credentials. He was raised up under the right guy, being taught the right things, and he was up and coming. That's Saul of Tarsus. They're in there the ministry of Christ. So it's important to kind of get that frame of mind. Let me also, just for help of it there, the word Pharisee is used 95 times in our New Testament, not used in the Old Testament. There were no Pharisees in the Old Testament. Uh, 87 times in the Gospels, 7 times in the book of Acts, and 1 time by Paul in the book of Philippians. That a Pharisee was one of the sect among the Jews whose religion consisted in a strict observance of rites and ceremonies and of the traditions of the elders and whose pretended holiness let them, led them to separate themselves as a sect <coughs> considering themselves more righteous than the other Jews. Sound familiar? Yes. The Pharisees would have been the independent fundamentalists mm -hmm. of our day. <laughs> Now the Sadducees, they were the liberals. They were the new evangelicals of our day. So that's kind of where you are, setting up a, a context of the circumstances and the situation. So now go with me back to Matthew chapter three. We've laid a little foundation there. Go with me to Matthew three, and you know, you're familiar, you already know where I'm going there. So Matthew chapter 3, begin reading verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Now again, think about the description we have in Scripture about the Pharisees. They had their robes, their phylacteries, and all their garb that went with all that. I mean, you know, yeah, they were somebody. Yep. And here's old John the Baptist out there, this rough, uncouth. I mean, the guy eats grasshoppers and honey. And he's clothed in camel's hair. I mean, he's a roughneck kind of guy. Remember, Saul of Tarsus is his early mid-twenties. He's looking for robes and phylacteries and all the stuff that goes with that. And here's this guy out there dressed like a wild man. And he's preaching to the Jews. And worse than he's preaching to them, they're responding. They're giving him audience. See how we're building this story? Think about what's going on. What's going on in that young man's mind as he's watching and seeing that stuff go on? Well, let's stay in the saddle. Verse 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, so that's when John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism. They weren't coming to be baptized, they were coming to watch. Yeah. Come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. And he, shall, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's John the Baptist 
when the Pharisees and Sadducees comes out, he's standing there maybe waist deep in water or ankle deep in water or whatever, and he points his finger at those guys, and this is the message he gives them. The generation of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, I'm not going to tell you Saul of Tarsus was there because the scripture doesn't tell us that. I'll tell you something I have learned by listening to Jerry Lockhart. Oh. All right? Don't preach what ain't there. Now, if, you ever listen, if you listen to Jerry on a regular basis, how many times he tell you that? That's just, that's just one of his things. And let's have a Bible study. How about it? <laughs> All right. So one of the things I've learned from Jerry is by listening is you don't put things in there that aren't there. So I'm not going to tell you that Saul of Tarsus was standing at the River Jordan and was a part of that audience. But I'm going to tell you what. The next morning at Hardy's at the coffee shop, all them Pharisees gathered around telling, we were out there at the River Jordan yesterday and we were watching this John the Baptist do his thing and you ain't going to believe what he said to us. <laughs> he pointed his old finger at us, that old uncouth guy out there with grasshoppers on his breath, and he pointed at us, and he said, you generation of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Remember who Saul of Tarsus is. He's 22, 23, 24, 25 years old, and he's hearing that. Well, who does that rascal think he is? I'm going to give him peace of my mind. You think that could have been the case? Yeah. Turn over to Matthew chapter 9. I mean, I'm not, I don't have time. I'm not covering every text I've got here. But we're just going to hit a few up. Matthew chapter 9. Verse 27. Matthew 9, 27. When Jesus Parted thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and uh, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. And then touched he th their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and to let Jesus straightly charge them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his frame and fame in all that country. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with the devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb man, the dumb spake, and the multitude marveled, saying, It was never as so seen in Israel, verse 34. But the Pharisees said, He casteth out devils through the prince of the devil. Saul of Tarsus. Again, if he wasn't there. He ain't the one who said it. He heard about it at the coffee shop the next morning. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. Go to Luke chapter 7. We're going to be back and forth a little bit. Go to Luke chapter 7. <coughs> Begin verse 24. Luke chapter 7, begin at verse 24. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak. This is Jesus, of course. You got a red letter Bible, you know that. I don't have a red letter Bible, so I have to point it out. Again, verse 24. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out to, unto the wilderness before to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. Mm. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. Verse 30. But, what, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. There's 
Pharisees. Again, if Saul of Tarsus wasn't a part of that, he heard about it at the coffee shop the next morning. All right, go with me back to uh, Mark chapter 3. See, we read through the Gospels, and we don't go back there and put Saul of Tarsus back in there with these Pharisee accounts. But it helps us understand a whole lot more about Saul of Tarsus on that road to Damascus and what was going on when we get there. Mark chapter 3. Again, verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him. I wonder who was watching. Might have been. It's all Tarsus. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. So again, he looks at that those Pharisees over there, and he asks the question, is it lawful for me to do this? They keep their mouth shut. Verse 5, and when he had looked around about on them with anger, here's Jesus looking at them Pharisees with anger. Being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as the other. Verse 6, and the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. You reckon they got mad about that? <laughs> now again, if I'm not saying Saul was there, but I'm telling you he heard about it at the coffee shop the next morning. <laughs> Where else do we want to go? I'm skipping a bunch of stuff. Matthew 15, back to Matthew. Why I didn't just put them all in books of the order, order the books, I don't know. Matthew 15, beginning verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? I mean, Jesus just had a way to make them dudes mad. <laughs> he just had a way to get under their skin. Verse 4. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, uh, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Sounds like a modern Bible rewriter, doesn't it? But it says, You have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites. Well did Isaiah the prophets, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh to me with their uh, draw nigh, draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they, they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth of the mouth. Uh, this defileth a man. And we were in these areas this week, this weekend. Then, verse 12, Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? <laughs> said, Lord, I mean, you're upsetting them big dogs. Verse 13, <coughs> But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Verse 14, Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. I think that's where I want to go. Again, if Saul wasn't there, 
<laughs> he heard about it in the coffee shop. I mean, this is just, just this, and, and, and this is accumulating. Think about that. We're not just, we don't just have individual instances and events that take place that are isolating all of themselves. This thing's building. From the beginning of the job of the Baptist ministry, you generation of vipers, who warned you for flee from the wrath to come? All the way through now, the earthly ministry of Christ, every encounter that the Pharisees had with Jesus or the apostles, they were scolded every time. And it's accumulating. So who's this young man? 22, 23, 24, 25 years old. He keeps, he's either hearing it firsthand or he's hearing about it at the coffee shop. This thing keeps building. And he's hearing it week after week, month after month. For three years, he's hearing this going on. Remember who Saul of Tarsus is? Remember how old he is? How dare these people say this thing? How dare these people treat us like this? Look across the page at Matthew 16 there. Verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning... It will be bow weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. I mean, he had a press conference and left and wouldn't let any of them ask any questions. And here he is again. I mean, they've been called vipers and, and all that stuff. They've been called hypocrites. And, and now he's pointing his finger and calling them a wicked, adulterous generation. And, he's, and, and here he's giving them a sign. Do you think maybe after his resurrection, this sign of the prophet Jonah, do you think some of those Pharisees might have said, at the coffee shop, lowering their voices because they don't want too many people to hear him talking about it like that saying yeah. boys he told us <laughs> <laughs> he pointed his finger and he told us now I don't know that that happened it's not in scripture I'm just surmising I hope it's not evil surmising <laughs> but it's painting a picture Amen. how this thing built how this animosity the Pharisees would have had would have built. I mean, here these guys are. They're not part of us. They didn't come up with us. They're not playing by our rules. They're not part of our association. They're not, I mean, uh, we, you know, uh, we, we got more tolerance for the Sadducees than we do with this bunch that's following this Jesus character. I mean, even when we have our debates and our discussions, you know, in the council, uh, we have respect for one another. We might get heated, but I've never had a Sadducee call me a generation of vipers. <laughs> Hearing all that building up? Yep. Let's go to Matthew 21. I'm kind of picking and choosing through this long list. Where do I want to go? Start verse uh, 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and, hit, and hedged it round about and dig the wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went out and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit grew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one and killed another and uh, stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto, him, uh, did unto them likewise. But last of all, verse 37, 
he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husband saw the son, they said among, them, among themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto, their, unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Now there's a lot of doctrine in all this stuff. I know I'm not getting all the doctrine that's there. Verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our, in, in our eyes. Therefore say unto you that the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. That's some strong words. You guys think you're somewhat. And I'm here to tell you that what you think you've got, you really don't have, and it's going to be taken care of away from you and given to somebody else who's going to do with what they're supposed to. Amen. We don't like that. If he wasn't there, heard about the coffee shop. he heard about it at the coffee shop the next morning. <laughs> Uh, let me take you one more place on this. I, I got to say one more. Maybe two. Maybe three. Let's do it. John chapter 7. We'll go to John now. We're going to read a couple of things in John, and then we'll move on. John chapter 7. Begin at verse 31. John 7, 31. Many of the people believed, verse, verse 31, John 7, verse 31. Many of the people believed on him and said, When Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? First, the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and chief priests sent officers to take him. Saul wasn't among that group. He heard about it in the coffee shop the next morning. Amen. So the Pharisees uh, sent, and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Verse 33, then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while I'm with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go into the dispersing among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this, that, that he said, Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Now they're puzzled. No spiritual discernment whatsoever. What's he talking about? Chapter 11 of John. Again, I know I'm not elaborating on all the doctrine that's in there and what's being said, but I'm just trying to paint that picture. I don't have time for the elaboration. Verse 46, John 11. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. This is at the raising of Lazarus. Verse 46, but some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. So here's, here's Jews that saw what happened with Jesus calling Pharisees and drawing Lazarus out of the tomb. Some of them believed and a bunch of them went and tattled. They ran to the Pharisees. Can you believe what this guy just did? We don't know how he did it, but here's what he just did. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council. And it's just hard for me not to believe that Saul wouldn't have been part of all this. At least privy to the information. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. <laughs> Can't have that. If we, let him, if, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. 
and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and the nation. Now we really know what it's all about, isn't it? About position, prestige. Amen. It all comes back to the livelihood. Yep. Verse 49, and none of them named, and one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest the same year, that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that, that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. Now, don't misrepresent that he's thinking that Jesus is going to die for their sins. Amen. It's if this guy continues doing what he's doing, we're going to lose our place, and it would be better for us to kill him so we don't lose our place. Amen. That's what's being said here. That's why he's saying uh, it's expedient for us that uh, that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. It's better for us to see Jesus die than for us to lose our place. That's the mindset of the Pharisees. Verse uh, 52. And not for that nation only, but that he, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Then came, then from that day forth they took counsel together for to put him to death. Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews. Uh, but he went thence into a country near to the wilderness, into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with the disciples. Well, let's go ahead and read through the end here. And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and many went out of the count of the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. There then sought they for Jesus, and spake among themselves as they stood in the temple, What think ye that he that he will come to the feast? Now both the chief priest and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he where he were, he would he should show it that they might take him. Again, if, if Saul of Tarsus wasn't part of that, heard about it at Hardy. He heard about it at Hardy's at the coffee shop. One final place in this where we're at right now. John 18. Verse 2 and 3. <clears throat> and Judas also, now again, you know I'm just dropping in where we are here. You'll, you're familiar enough. <clears throat> and Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches, and weapons. You know where they are. You know what's fixing to happen. And who is it that's there? Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, they come there to the garden to arrest Jesus. You think Saul talked this might have knew about that? You see how this thing's been building? And I mean, we skipped a bunch of confrontations through here for time's sake, but I'm trying to show you that by the time Jesus gets to the cross, a lot of times folks will talk about, well, Saul never saw Jesus until Acts 9, the road to Damascus. I just really find that hard to believe. Yeah. I mean, he's a young man. He wants to be a part of everything. He's up and coming. He, he, he has either been present or has heard about it at the coffee shop. All this stuff that's been going on for these three years. And it's building. And it's building. And it's building. Do you think Saul of Tarsus would have missed Passover? No. No. He was there. I mean, he's up and coming. He's at he's there. Do you think when all the stuff that took place with the trial and now Jesus there and Pilate coming out and Pilate's wanting to, to, to turn Jesus loose and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and the Pharisees are stirring up the people and telling them, don't take Jesus, take this Barabbas. We need to crucify this Jesus. Remember what they said there earlier? 
It's better for one man to die than for us to lose our place. That's what was behind all that. Do you think Saul of Tarsus might have been one of those guys, young man, moving around that crowd? Barabbas crucified Jesus. Hey guys, Barabbas crucified Jesus. Him moving around that crowd. Hey guys, Barabbas, that's who we want. Crucified Jesus. Do you think Saul of Tarsus might have been one of those guys? Again, I ain't going to tell you he did because it don't say so. But in my mind, in my imagination, just kind of reading between those lines, uh, I'd be surprised to find out that he didn't. He's a Pharisee. He's a Pharisee. Again, he's a young man. He's full of piss and vinegar. <laughs> he's, and this thing's been built. This animosity's been built. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. The tribe of Benjamin. Concerning the law, Pharisee. Raised up under the feet of Gamaliel. We're not going to have Jesus and his crowd taking away our place. I mean, Saul's a young man. He's looking for his future. I mean, one of these days, I'm going to be one of those big dogs sitting up there on the high porches. <laughs> he's trying to take care of himself, too. Amen. He's zealous of the law. These guys, I mean, we are the keepers of the law. Remember, Jesus said, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Whatsoever they bid you do, what observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Do you think 50 days later that Saul of Tarsus might be a Yep. Do you think when all that stuff transpired in Acts chapter 2, do you think Saul of Tarsus might have been hearing Peter standing up there declaring that? Yep. Do you think he might have been a witness to all those men speaking in those tongues and all these Jews? And they're, you know, they're hearing this thing. And, and again, you know, you know how what happens in the crowd. These guys are standing up and they're preaching, and these fellas from all these different places, knowing all these different languages, they're hearing them and they're understanding them, and they're looking at one another and they're saying in their language to each other, you know, well, hey, these guys are from these are ignorant fishermen, most of them from Galilee. How would they know this? All that's going on. <clears throat> I don't know if it was a Pharisee or not, but I bet it was somebody among them that stirred up. Uh, these men are new, these men are full of new wine. Yeah. I mean, they got to discredit what's going on, don't they? Mm -hmm. I've always chuckled at this thing. Peter says, "These men are not." Drunk with wine, seeing this but the third hour of the day. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Now, if you come back at nine o'clock at night, they might be a little tipsy. I just always thought that was funny how they put that in there, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. It's just nine o'clock in the morning, guys. They ain't started yet. <laughs> they might later, but not right now. It's too early. I think Saul of Tarsus was right there among all that. And he's seeing all this take place. And then he's hearing, and he's, 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 he's hearing Peter's message. And ye men of Israel, ye men of Judea, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, God made him both Lord and Christ. I'm telling you, that young man, now 25 or 26 or so years old, he don't like it. It's just built. You go on through there, the ministry now of the 12, and you think about what took place in the book of Acts, the preaching of Philip. Now you get over there to Acts chapter 7. Go ahead and turn over there. We're not going to read all of Saul's or Philip's or Stephen's message there. We're just going to get to that place where you know we're going. You got Stephen's message. I mean, they killed him. Now they say he's alive. Now we got 
3,000 on that day of Pentecost that responded and were baptized and believed on him. And, and now, you, you know, a little later there, you had 5,000 that responded and believed on him. And boys, I mean, those guys were sitting around the coffee shop saying, we got to do something about this. Amen. Here's Saul. I'm going to do something about it. I mean, we can sit here and talk all day. Somebody's got to do something. All we've done is talk. You ever been in a crowd like that? A whole bunch of talking, everybody talking about this is what we need to do, this is what we ought to do. Nobody gets up and goes and does anything. Goes and does anything. <laughs> goes to do anything. Goes and does anything. So Tarsus sitting there at Hardy's one morning. He says, boys, I'm tired of talking. I'm going to do something. Amen. So here's Stephen standing up there. And Stephen's bringing this railing, uh, I mean railing message to Israel. And he's been able to, Saul's been able to stir up some of these other guys too. By this time Saul's coming on, you know, he's now, what, because this is, you know, a couple years later. These things are going on. A year or two later. So here we are. Let's pick up verse 54. Acts 7. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Now they didn't cut, they weren't cut to their heart and then said, Men, brethren, what shall we do? Like they did in Acts 2. Acts 2, they said, they were cut to the heart. What do we do? Repent and be baptized. Here they're cut to their heart, but what do they do? They gnashed on him with their teeth. You know what that means? It means they gnashed on him with their teeth. That's some pretty, you talk about some anger. I mean, I've been mad before, and I've been what you call fighting mad, and spitting nail, and, and, and spitting mad, and biting nail into kind of mad, but I, I've never been so, and I've punched people before. I've done that kind of stuff, you know, back in my younger years when I was, Oh. <laughs> Full of piss and vinegar. <laughs> I ain't never gnashed on anybody with their teeth since I was two or three. <laughs> Verse 65. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Uh, that's that well I won't chase the rabbit, but there's there's, there's stuff right there, isn't there? And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Oh. Oh. Now I don't know, I can't help but just as I put in my mind the, the picture together. I'm thinking Saul of Tarsus was the one that probably organized and instigated and goaded that thing that happened with Stephen on. Yeah, right. oh, yeah. Maybe he got some other young men full of them. Gathered them up. He stirred that thing up and he's over here. You know, he sent them out like, like a hunter sending his hunting dog out, you know. He sent them out and now he's standing there supervising, endorsing, encouraging. So they laid their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when they, and when he had said this, he fell asleep. Chapter 8, verse 1, And Saul consenting unto his death, and at that time, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of, all, of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them in, to prison. He's finally got his bones, hey. He's reached that place. Saul of Tarsus. This is who Saul was. 
So when you get over that Acts chapter 9 now, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest. Can you picture how this thing's been accumulating? Hmm. How this pot has been coming to a boil? Yep. How this thing has just been building and building and building. And here's this young man, Saul, who's rising up to this place and, 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 and pulling this. I mean, he's pulling out all the stops now. And he's been this thing with Stephen. And now he's going to the high. And he's been a part of all that in Jerusalem. And uh, so here he is yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter. Uh, against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters into Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? I've heard Steve Atwood preach that, and he said he can just see Saul sitting there saying, please don't say Jesus, please don't say Jesus, please don't say Jesus. You can kind of picture that. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I believe this is one of those times where he asked the question he already knew the answer to, he was just afraid to get it. Again, if, if I believe Saul had enough interaction through that three years I believe Saul probably recognized his voice. I don't know that. Like Jerry said, don't put in there one ain't there. <laughs> but I'm just, you know, throwing it out there. It wouldn't surprise me to know that Saul recognized his voice. He said, who art thou, Lord? He knew. Who art thou, Lord? The Lord said unto him, what Saul did not want to hear. I'm Jesus. I'm that Jesus that John the Baptist baptized over there in the River Jordan. I'm that Jesus that tried to tell you for three years. And you just hated it and you respond and you, you you rejected it and you refused to believe it. I'm that Jesus. I met Jesus who after I left fulfilling the sign I told you I was going to fulfill, the sign of the prophet Jonah. I'm that Jesus that after I ascended, I poured out the Holy Spirit of God and those preachers there on the day of Pentecost preached to you and old Stephen preached to you and you refused to believe the Holy Spirit in order words. That's who I am. Amen. I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the priest. And I'm by that I mean it's just like those guys in Acts 2. They were they were pricked in the heart. It makes me think that along that trail somewhere, there could have possibly been some lingering thought. In Saul of Tarsus' mind, I wonder if he's real. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to me, it, it, because when I hear about that, you know, they, 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 were, they, were, they were cut to the heart or they kicked against the pricks, that, that's always an indication of some kind of conviction that was going on there to me. And so when he says, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Saul, I know who you are. I know how you've been doing. I've been trying to persuade you correctly. But you've been kicking against the bricks. And really, really kicking against the bricks. You've been fighting this thing and fighting this thing and fighting this thing. Saul, you're fighting this thing like no one else has ever done. And we could go on to say, Saul, you're fighting this life thing like no one else is going to do after you get through this encounter. Because <laughs> we're told later on, didn't the churches have rest after Saul of Tarsus was converted? So nobody picked up Saul's mantle, right? It's hard for them to kick against the pricks. And he trembling 
might be a sub. And astonished to the Lord. You talk about being confronted with the overwhelming reality that this man that you've been rejecting and fighting against so violently and so viciously for three, three and a half, four and a half, now five, maybe coming on years, this man, maybe six years, you've been fighting against this thing and fighting against this man and fighting who he is and the message that his disciples and the apostles and so on had. You've been, you, you to find out that he was who he said he was. And to know what you're guilty of. He trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do I have me to do? The Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it should be told thee what thou must do. Of course, we get them, you know, we can read on through there. We're not going to do that. But it was here that Jesus of Nazareth, the ascended Lord Jesus Christ, this one that Saul of Tarsus had been fighting and rejecting since he was introduced to him by John the Baptist back there in Matthew 3 and fighting against the Holy Spirit anointed preaching for a couple of years there at the, after from the beginning of Pentecost, here he is. And I don't know how all that happened, but somewhere along, somewhere in that way, Saul of Tarsus understood that gospel did he believed on Jesus Amen. and trusted Christ <laughs> as his own. Amen. Amen. Now go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We'll be through. Timothy chapter 1. Let's just begin at verse 12. <clears throat> we know where we are in Paul's ministry. We know where, you know where we are when he's writing 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. He's coming toward the end of his life. And considering all that we've been talking about through here, now we get in here and read begin at verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now again, I, I just picture Paul now with a very humble heart. I don't know about you, I, I, I was an old hippie, hoodlum, drug-taking, pill-popping, thieving, Hoodlum kid when the Lord rescued me. That's why God saves old sinners. And the idea that when I think about who I was and the depths of depravity I had gone to at such an early age of my life and, and all the things that I was involved in as a 15-year-old boy uh, and that God would save me it's a real humbling thing. I don't know about you, but I, I had I had boys I ran with, and I was kind of the leader of the pack, but there was four or five guys I ran with, and uh, and uh, they didn't get the opportunity out there. Every one of those guys I ran with, they, they all died early deaths because of the life we lived. They were all in their 20s, and 30, 20s or 30s when they died. Four or five boys that I ran with. The Lord rescued me. And I stepped back and said, God, why me? How did I get this opportunity? Yeah. Yeah. Timothy Alexander didn't get it. Charles Weber didn't get it. Blue Gentry didn't get it. I got it. Well, I can't help but picture 
Paul as he's writing First Timothy here with some of that kind of on his heart. These other young men full of themselves coming up with him. These guys he stirred up to go against Stephen. Not to mention all these people that he had been involved with with torturing and punishing and all that went with all that. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord that he who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful and put me and putting me in the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy. Because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. You think you think that Saul of Tarsus understood the grace and love and mercy of Christ Jesus? Amen. Oh, probably more than anyone else ever did, ever has, ever will. Grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying. <clears throat> that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Amen. 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 Paul says, of whom I'm chief. Yeah. And maybe by going through and thinking about all this that we've been through, it helps us understand what he meant by that. Yeah. Whom I'm chief. <clears throat> I mean, there, there was nobody more vile against the ministry of Jesus than I was. There was nobody more vile and violent against the ministry of the Twelve than I was. There was nobody more violent against Stephen, Philip, those guys, than I was. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners whom I'm in chief how be it that's always a good word how be it for this cause here's why he saved me the chief of sinners for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth a path of, uh, might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the king immortal, and king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I mean, you read down through there, you always, you always kind of wonder, well, why is verse 17 there? I mean, that just seems like a big statement to add to all that. But when you think about what all Paul's been and who he was, who all Saul was and who he'd been and what he had done, and you come down through that, reading through that, and then you get to that. <laughs> now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, the honor and glory, amen. forever and ever, amen. And here's the point of the whole message. You always like it when you see the preacher putting his notes away and closing his Bible. <laughs> Here's the point of the whole message. If God could save Saul, if, if God could save Saul of Tarsus, he can save you. Amen. I mean, there it is. If God could save Saul of Tarsus in your religion or your rejection, he can save me. Amen. Right. Folks, that's good news. Amen. Amen. I am so glad God saves old sinners. I'm thrilled and amazed how he sets us free. But the biggest surprise in redeeming old sinners that he would save sinner like me. an old sinner like me. Amen. 
I don't know who wrote that song, but Saul of Tarsus could have written that song. Yeah. <laughs> Trust Christ. Amen. Amen. He can save Saul. He can save us. Amen. Amen. Amen.